Loops are one of the most fundamental building blocks of video games. Games use them to establish player behaviours and structure the narrative and play session in the form of missions and quests. Loops are used for gameplay progression such as research points for tech trees and so much more. But in games we do a lot of things repetitively, and some of these things could be considered loops. Why are they valuable to someone interested in game design? That's what we are going to be digging into in this video, where we break down the structure of a loop and talk about how to use it to analyse games. Hi, my name is Geedy McD. Great to have you around. Here on the channel we talk about the ins and outs of game design so that you are equipped to analyse, discuss and create great games. This is a mobile game called Clash of Clans. Clash of Clans is a very good example of a city builder or base building game, a genre of game that exploded in popularity since the rise of the smartphone and the free to play market. Base building is an interesting genre, as a play session may involve opening the game, collecting resources and then immediately closing the game, with such a session lasting as short as a few seconds. That is because base building games, along with many mobile titles, have distilled the game design concept of loops down to being the base mechanic of the game. Collect resources, look at what to build next, queue it to build, leave, and come back when the building has completed. Repeat process. With a lot of the mechanics that are present in hardcore console and PC games completely stripped out, Clash of Clans is a good vehicle for talking about loops. Loops are a concept that can be found in the interaction design and learning fields. When the brain is interacting with something, there is a process that it goes through in order to adapt to its surroundings. There are several different versions of this loop, so we will be using the one proposed by Daniel Cook of Spry Fox. The process looks like this. We start at the top, where we have a store of information the brain already has. This is called the mental model. At the start of the game, this is likely going to be pretty empty, although it may have common things like genre constants to draw upon. An example of a genre constant might be most first-person shooters have very similar controls. The brain uses this information to devise an action that may have an effect on the current situation, and then it acts. The action, in the case of a game, is received by the system and run through the rules. This is the part where the game takes the action the player has taken and reacts to it with an output. This output is then fed back to the player as a response to what has happened after their action, also known as feedback. The player then receives this information, interprets it by referencing it with their current understanding and tries to fit the new feedback into their mental model. The process then repeats. Here is some footage of the Xbox One game Recall. Let's watch it through once, then we will analyse the passage of play with our new fancy loop structure. Try to pick out the progressions through the loop as we are watching it. So what happened? On the ground there is a button, and in the distance a door. Using my mental model, I surmise that running onto the button will trigger the door to open. This is obviously just a guess, but I do know a little bit about how other games use buttons. I choose to act by running onto the button. The game recognises my action of running onto the button, the door opens. As feedback for my action affecting the rules of the game, the game animates the button down so that I know that my action has had an effect and I notice the door is open. I see both of these things and I interpret that me running onto the button depresses it and I make the link that depressing the button seems to open the door. This affects that. I then go through the whole loop structure again by deciding that I need to travel through the newly opened door, but it shuts. After the door closes, I add what I have just seen to my mental model and devise a theory that the door closes after a short period of time. Okay, now I need to go back to my mental model and use what I know to come up with a new action. I figure that if I press the button, the door will open. Let's do that. Excellent, okay, the door is open. So I'm pretty sure that I'm right about the door button situation. Two for two so far. Now, it says up in the tooltip, press B to dash. Maybe dashing will get me through this door. Using my mental model, I surmise that if I run forward for a portion of the distance, then dash, I will make it through the door before it closes. Let's try that. Okay, damn, I dashed too late. Add to my mental model that running too much before dashing will not allow me enough time to get through the door. Right, so the button opens the door, cool. If I can't dash too late, let's swap things around and try dashing at the start instead. Yay, my theory was correct, we made it through the door. Okay, and so now back into my mental model I put, to get through that door, push the button and then dash off the plate first, and then run the remaining distance. This may potentially be a value later, so I'm going to store it in my mental model. Whew, 
That was a long 20 seconds. Let's take a breather. Right, so even though that section of play was only something like 20 seconds, it can be seen how the player will go through this loop of coming up with an idea, acting on it, waiting for the game to process that action and give them feedback, and then applying this new information to their mental model. That was also a good example to show how loops come in different sizes. Games are made up of all sized loops. Again, using terminology from Daniel Cook, games can have fast, frequent loops, all the way out to slow, infrequent loops. So a fast loop might be, can I press the button? Yes, I can, cool. Add that I can stand on buttons to my mental model. A slightly slower loop is that if I mix dash with running at the right time, I can make it through the door. And this is where we come back to Clash of Clans. As we said before, you might have a play session that is just open the game, collect resources, close the game. But as you progress, your investment in the game goes up. Buildings can take longer and longer to upgrade, getting out to multiple days at a time. So you are now using your mental model to come up with the best decision for the next upgrade. For example, when I stopped playing, it was best to upgrade everything you possibly could before upgrading to the new Citadel level and going up a level. This is my village from when I was playing Clash of Clans about two, two and a half years ago. As you can see, some of the buildings take huge amounts of resources and time to upgrade. At the point when I quit, some of the buildings were so expensive that many of the resources would be stolen before I had a chance to collect enough to make the next upgrade. These kind of loops would span over several days. As a last little piece of the model, I'm going to add this line. This is what I'm going to call the perception line. Everything above the perception line is available information to the player. Everything below the perception line is hidden. So from the player's perspective, they don't understand what the system is doing. They just take actions and are waiting for feedback to see if their actions did anything. So if something isn't working in your game, you can break the mechanic down into its loop components. Does the loop look like this? If you miss the feedback step, the game might be processing the player's actions, but the player doesn't know whether the game is doing anything or not. Hidden Folks is a game that works similar to Where's Wally books. In a GDC talk, the developer of Hidden Folks spoke about players not realizing you could slide things out of the way to find characters. This is because there wasn't any feedback for the user to interpret. The solution the developer implemented to fix this was, if a player tapped on an object that could slide, but then didn't slide it, the object would wiggle. This wiggle completes the loop by providing feedback for an action which allows the player to adjust their mental model. Loops can also end up looking like the opposite. In a situation like this, the player will generally receive some feedback, but hasn't done anything to trigger it. The player now needs to reverse engineer the loop structure from their mental model and their surroundings. This can be fine if it's intentional, but you can use the idea of loops to assess what is going through the player's mind when it is unintentional. A good example of this is when you take damage randomly in a game like Fallout or Call of Duty, and you maniacally flail around trying to find out where the damage was coming from. This kind of broken loop can often be quite funny to watch. If you can think of any other good ones, put them in the comments section and we'll all have a laugh. So is there any situations in your game where you think this might be happening? where the player is receiving feedback, but they haven't necessarily taken an action for it. And is this potentially what is confusing your players when you watch them play your game? Another way to use loops is to assess whether your feedback is being interpreted into the mental model of the player correctly. This is some footage from Final Fantasy XV, A New Empire, the mobile game. It at first looks very similar to Clash of Clans. The way I ended up playing this game was that instead of the feedback telling me this building does this, information which I should add to my mental model to make informed decisions in the future, I found myself just following the hand around for half an hour without being taught very much about the game and how the systems interconnect. Once the game stopped handholding me, my mental model didn't say, this is what I should do next because it will help my empire. It was press quest, upgrade building, repeat. At one point, I trained a soldier from the training grounds. By the end, I still had no idea what the purpose of that action was. My interpretation of the feedback didn't translate into helpful information in my mental model. Despite that, hopefully the information in this video has translated into helpful information for your mental model. If it has, I would love if you would subscribe to the channel. If you would rather not, that's cool, but maybe just leave a like on the video so that other people can find it. Here on the channel, we talk about the ins and outs of game design so that you are equipped to analyze, discuss, and create great games.